All right, uh, here we go. Okay. Hey, everybody. If you're watching this live or listening to this as the podcast afterwards, uh, this is the much anticipated, much awaited uh, interview with uh, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Uh, Dr. Zubrin, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, well, so but first, uh, you know, before we get into the details of this uh, of this whole interview, I want to thank you personally for literally being one of the main inspirations for my entire career in space journalism. Um, I was working uh, in a in a web design shop in Vancouver, kind of feeling a little uh, not sure what I wanted to do with my life. And I picked up two books. I picked up The Case for Mars, because I'd always been into amateur astronomy and space exploration. I love the Our Universe book. So I picked up Pale Blue Dot by Carl Sagan and Case for Mars. And this was like 1998 or so. And I, um, I read both books cover to cover and sort of got these two really wonderful perspectives on just sort of like what where we stood today and just what's possible for the future of human space exploration and it sort of you know it was like a lightning bolt in my brain and and from that point on you know i sort of decided i was going to learn more about sort of the nature of human space exploration and it literally just turned into my entire career so so the fact that i do this job is all your fault all right. Well, thanks. Well, now I have a new book. It's called The Case for Space. I've got it right here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, like, you know, at this point, you know, 20 years, my understanding of everything that happens in, in space exploration, uh, you know, my knowledge has become a lot more nuanced. So, so as uncomfortable as the rest of this interview goes, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for lighting that fire in me in and being fascinated about this and... And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And uh, so thank you. Um, all right. So now I want to sort of, there's, a, there's so many topics and literally the case for space, which I, I highly recommend people read. It, you know, starts out slow and then is just this fire hose of here's what we can do with Jupiter. Here's what we can do in the outer solar system. Here's how we can go to other star systems. What, you know, like every idea, every science fiction idea that's been, been thought of, it's, it's, it's all in there. And it's, it's funny to me because the impact of the case for Mars was so much greater than, than I think what is now. So I guess my question really is like, now that we are 20 years after more, the Mars direct plan, do you find that it's, it's almost like it's assumed? Is that making your job more difficult? Uh, no, it's not making my job more difficult. It's, uh, uh, well, look, the, the case for Mars had a certain influence on NASA's thinking about Mars, but it also had uh, influence elsewhere, for example, on people like Elon Musk, who it had a role in helping to convince make Mars his calling, and many of the people at SpaceX. And, uh, and well, of course, uh, there's been other influences as well, both on them and many other people, but what we have, and, and then there's an alternative vision that was offered by uh, Gerard O'Neill, which had a lot of influence, for instance, on Jeff Bezos. But what has happened as a result is we show that this kind of stuff is possible, that this is necessary for a positive human future. And um, while NASA has supported it, particularly with their robotic space exploration, which has really identified uh, potential resources on the moon and Mars and so on, yeah. uh, it has been uh, frustrating with its human spaceflight program. Uh, but the, the, we now have an entrepreneurial revolution. Some of these uh, 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 converts have stepped up to say, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make it happen. And, uh, and of course, Musk in particular has demonstrated that it is possible for this to be done in an entrepreneurial way and not just be done, but be done in a third the time at a tenth the cost and even do things that have been deemed impossible altogether. And in consequence, setting off uh, entrepreneurial space race and space launch and related races in spacecraft and space technology and even 
further uh, races outside of space per se. For example, we now have an entrepreneurial race in fusion power because investors took a look at fusion and said, maybe the problem, maybe the reason why we weren't getting anywhere in fusion was the same reason why we weren't getting anywhere with uh, reusable space launch vehicles. Maybe the fundamental problem wasn't technical, but institutional. And, um, and, and, and now that stuff's off to the races. And um, even though um, Musk has never expressed much interest in fusion power, I, if, if fusion power is developed in the 20s, it'll be because of him um, and uh, because of his example. And uh, so this is happening. And look, if, if you were to ask me, when do I think we're going to reach Mars? Uh, I will tell you we're going to reach by the end of the 20s, although not based on the official NASA plan, which is uh, absurd, which isn't even a plan. It's more of a justification for the gateway uh, uh, than a real plan to go to Mars. But uh, but Musk and and people like him, uh, you know, you have the Starship. They are claiming they're going to reach orbit with Starship uh, by 2021. I think okay, maybe not so soon. But if Starship is flying heavy payloads to orbit by 2024, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. That's, that, yeah, uh, <laughs> because someone's going to be elected in 2024, and if he or she then asks their advisors, could we have humans on Mars by the, sec- by the end of my second term, and we have fully reusable heavy lift launch vehicles flying to Earth orbit by that time, the answer is going to be unquestionably yes, and it's not going to be for hundreds of billions of dollars or even tens of billions of dollars. It's going to be less than $10 billion. And at that point, in other words, by making the mission feasible, the entrepreneurs are going to make it sellable, and it's going to be sold. Um, so the, you know, you have a lot of pushback and ire for, for the plan that NASA is implementing. And I can definitely see that, you know, as an American, I'm a Canadian, so, you know, we just make arms, but, uh, you know, for, for the U S for taxpayers to see sort of on the one hand, what's being developed by NASA in the official capacity, and then you just, you compare and contrast that to what's going on in the private space industry. Um, makes you upset. So can you sort of give us a sense of sort of how you feel uh, sort of the state of where NASA is today? And especially, I mean, I think that like the evidence appears to be overwhelming at this point that there are other ways to approach this challenge. Right. Well, look, uh, NASA um, has two different modes of operation. Um uh, which is a purpose-driven mode and a vendor-driven mode. Uh, Apollo was purpose-driven, although the purpose wasn't science, it was geostrategic, but nevertheless, it was purpose-driven, okay? And the science programs, the robotic planetary probes, the space astronomy missions were and remain purpose-driven. In those programs, you spend money to do great things, okay? Uh, But there's an alternative mode, which is the vendor-driven mode, where you do things in order to spend a great deal of money. Uh, and unfortunately, once the human spaceflight program lost its clear objective after Apollo, um, and uh, given that it was basically half of NASA's budget, so it was the biggest money uh, of any single thing in NASA by far, um, it became uh, about the money, not about the mission. And I mean, look, you know, we launched something like 130 shuttles how many of them really had bona fide missions? Okay, well, there are five that launched and repaired and upgraded the Hubble Space Telescope. That was great. There are several others that did important missions, but most of the 130 were just flying the shuttle in order to fly the shuttle, um, you know, at, at the cost of, 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 depending upon how you count, somewhere between half a billion and a billion dollars a flight. They were literally doing it in order to spend money. And here you have uh, the Trump administration says it wants to return to the moon by 2024. And by the way, uh, I believe it is possible to return to the moon by 2024. And I believe that if you do want to return to the moon, you should set a deadline like that because it shouldn't take more than five years. I mean, five years is what separated 1964 from 1969. And, and we're certainly a lot closer to being able to land mo- people on the moon today than we were in 1964. OK, but uh, but you have to be serious about it. Uh, and they're not right. I mean, you take this gateway. Uh, 
does anyone believe that we would have reached the moon sooner in the 1960s if we had said before we land people on the moon, we need to build a space station in lunar orbit? Okay. There were people who claimed, uh, based on prior thinking, and they had some arguments in their defense that we have to build a space station in Earth orbit before we go. But in fact, we would have been able to get to the moon by 1969 if we'd done that. And so they were, in fact, pushed out of the way because Apollo was mission driven. And we were not trying to figure out the most elaborate and expensive way to do it. We were trying to figure out how to get the job done. Okay. Now, Gateway is like, um, uh, you know, somebody coming up to you and offering you the following business proposition. Um, uh, where in Canada do you live? Vancouver Island. Vancouver. Okay, good place. Uh, imagine someone came up to you and said, look, I want to rent you an office in Saskatoon. Because if you fly to Saskatoon, you can fly to anywhere else in the world from there. Uh, and so, but you're going to have to build the office building. You'll need to pay for that. And you need to pay $100,000 a month rent for the place. And it's a 30-year lease with no out clause. And you're going to have to spend one month a year in Saskatoon, whether you like it or not. And from now on, whenever you want to fly anywhere, you have to go through Saskatoon. Okay. Such a deal. Is this... Uh, you know, I mean, right. can turn this down. I say we should turn this down. Right. Uh, but the but that's what the gateway is for sure. And I th but I mean, isn't the gateway uh, the rational response from NASA to like Schrodinger's destination? Right. Like like we're going to go we're going to go to the moon and Mars and visit an asteroid and we're going to change our mind on you every administration um, and don't let us down. Okay, well, okay, the, first of all, the gateway was dreamed up under the Charlie Bolden uh, leadership of NASA. And if you'll recall, their previous uh, fetish was something called the Asteroid Redirect Mission, mm -hmm. where they would put about a three meter diameter boulder. So this really wasn't much of an asteroid, but that was as big as they could hope to move. They'd somehow move it from interplanetary space into lunar orbit so that we could visit it in the Orion. And what was this for? This was to have a place for Orion to fly to, okay? Because um, without a lander, Orion could not be used as part of either a lunar or Mars program. So they wanted to have some reason to fly it. You could go to the space station, in it, but it's way over designed for that application. So they said, we have to have a destination. We'll put one in lunar orbit. Then, and, and, and these people actually argued with a straight face that we have to do this before we go to Mars, that this is a key step on the way to Mars. I mean, no one had ever thought that having moving an asteroid into lunar orbit was important step on the way to Mars. It wasn't in Von Braun's original Mars plan. It wasn't even in the 90 day report where they put in every damn thing you could think of. It certainly wasn't in my Mars direct plan. It wasn't in the synthesis group plan. It wasn't in Griffin's plan. It, no one in their right mind. It's not in Musk's plan. He doesn't say, well, I want to go to Mars, but I think I need to move an asteroid into lunar orbit. No. So anyway, but they stuck with that until it eventually came out that it was impossible to move the asteroid into lunar orbit. So then some people said, well, why don't we pretend there's an asteroid in lunar orbit and we'll visit it and we'll be pretending to explore right. that. And, and that was like too dumb. But, but again, okay. so then they said, let's put a space station. Okay. And, and then come up with the, uh, 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 baloney argument that this is necessary to go to the moon or it's necessary to go to Mars. It is not necessary for either. It disadvantages both missions. Mm -hmm. uh, it it uh, adds Delta V to the mission. It adds phasing requirements. I mean, the, the lunar mission plan that they have right now that uses the gateway is absurd because in addition to having to create the gateway, which is several launches, each moon mission by the copy, according to their most recent plan, will require four launches, one of which is an SLS plus three commercial launches. And they'll all have to rendezvous with the gateway. And there's five different flight elements, four launch each time plus the gateway, any of which if they fail, will um, fail the whole mission. And there's actually six different rendezvous operations in the course of the mission. Apollo only needed one rendezvous. 
So this is a totally absurd architecture. It maximizes the probability of mission failure. It minimizes the number of missions you can do. Uh, it, it, it's crazy. And it's all to support this conceit of the gateway. And then their Mars mission is just off the chart nuts. And the, 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 but believe me, as someone who wants to go to Mars, uh, I would not consider uh, uh, assembling my mission at a lunar orbit gateway. Uh, it, it's just crazy. And, uh, and but all, if this gateway is built like that office in Saskatoon, you're going to be forced to use it because otherwise it will become clear right. that you never use it. It'll be like the space shuttle. Yeah. Right. You but have it, you must use it. Right. But but I guess I mean I I feel like you oversimplify the the dynamics. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, humans put people on the moon and it was done because there was clear will, clear direction from the administration, the engineering prowess to pull it off and a real alignment of objectives by everybody involved to make this happen with, you know, obviously the threat of the Soviets planning to do the same thing. So there was a race involved. You've got then this enormous infrastructure of people at NASA, you've got political will, you know, without necessarily that same driving um, direction, then everything kind of goes off the rails. And so and so I it, and so I think with the gateway, it feels like it is sort of the logical end of of one administration saying we're going to, you know, uh, Bush senior said we're going to go to Mars. Um, uh, Clinton said we're going to go to the moon. I forget where they said they were going to go. And then they started to, and then um, uh, Bush Jr. said we're going to go to the moon. And then the Obama administration said we're going to go to an asteroid. And now the Trump administration is, says we're going to go to to the moon and Mars. And at the same time, you've got all of these workers, all of these contractors who are working across the 50 states of the United States. All of the politicians are looking to make sure that they get reelected. The money flows to the existing aerospace firms in ways and the lobbyists support this. So, so it is, it's kind of deadlocked. And, well, and it took the, this icebreaker, uh, right? Of it's not, it's it, it's not an icebreaker. It's a quagmire. Uh, sure. It's something what, that you're looking to escape from. Okay, you know, uh, in 1989, when the first President Bush said, "I want to go to the moon and Mars," um, NASA at that time was interested in building the space station. So they insisted that the lunar mission architecture must be uh, uh, make maximum use of the space station, that moon missions would have to be assembled at the space station. And they basically, in order to insert that requirement into the lunar architecture, they made the moon mission so complicated they were not feasible. Right, the, the $500 and, and, billion and, dollar Battlestar yeah, right. Galactica. And, you know, and, and look, you know, in 1989, there were still plenty of people in NASA who had been in Apollo. Yes. And, uh, who had actually sent people to the moon themselves. And, you know, they looked at this and they said, you know, if we could put a man on the moon, why can't we put a man on the moon? Well, the reason why they couldn't put a man on the moon was there was these people who were trying to uh, 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 basically say to them, you can't do your mission until you do our mission. And, you, and furthermore, you have to make use of our thing if you want to go to the moon. So they had uh, erected an Earth orbit toll booth. Now, like, look at this. We actually have a space station right now. Is anyone saying let's assemble the moon mission at the space station? No, because the, 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 what they're really doing is they're using the moon mission as a rationale for building this piece of junk, which has, I mean, there are some reasons to have a space station, but we have one. So, you know, the purpose of going into space is not to just hang out in space. It's to go across space to the worlds on right. the other side of space. All right. Yep. And develop them. So this is this is just wrong. Now, look, I get the fact that there are people at various companies who like their jobs and want, they want their companies to get funding. I, I understand that. I like to eat too. We all got to buy groceries. But it's a huge failure in leadership in NASA to not to say, here's what we need to do. We will pay you to do this as opposed to having the vendors tell them, right. we want money, do this so you can give us money. Okay, it's like, you know, I, I have a small aerospace company here. 
I have to pay money to vendors for various things. But I don't take phone calls from vendors to say, hey, here we are, Denver Valve and Fitting. We'd like you to buy a thousand valves this month. <laughs> no, I order valves when I need them and I order yeah. the valves that I need. All right. Um, I, 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 I want to respect your time and, and uh, I wanted to definitely get your, uh, get your perspective on this, but I, I would also really like to talk about some of your ideas for the future. And, um, okay. and so I, 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 I feel like we got it. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think that, I think quagmire is a much better description. And, and I, I mean, I feel like what's happening with private industry is going to be the thing that at least casts a light on the quagmire because if Starship is flying to the moon and landing and returning, then everything sort of, um, uh, you know, then everything kind of changes. But but I'd like to go back and talk again sort of about your original Mars Direct plan because okay. the, you know, the I, and I think for a lot of people, they don't really kind of understand what the original plan was. And tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but the gist is, you know, you send humans to Mars on an exploration mission, you go for a longer mission time, you build as many of the resources as you can on the surface of Mars, especially the fuel for the return home. And then, um, and then you at a fraction of the price, you're able to create an exploration mission to Mars as sort of the first step on Mars. Has your thinking changed at all in the in, in terms Decades? of those uh, uh, baseline thoughts, no. Uh, d direct flight to Mars, no on-orbit assembly, use of Martian resources starting on the very first mission, long duration stay starting on the very first mission. Okay, And the mission is about being on Mars. It's not about flying as far as Mars. So this whole idea of NASA has of building an interplanetary spaceship that's going to go to Deimos and then come back and it's going to go to Phobos and come back and you know, relegating the development of Mars landers for some time in the far future is, is nonsense, okay? So the Mars Direct Plan as originally conceived, okay, is you have a heavy lift booster. First, you use one to throw an Earth return vehicle to Mars with no one in it. It lands on Mars. It makes its methane oxygen propellant out of local materials, water and CO2. Now you got a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for you on the surface of Mars. Once that's done, on the next launch, you launch out a Habitat spacecraft with a crew of four, five, six astronauts in it. They go, they land on Mars near the Earth return vehicle. They explore Mars for a year and a half until the launch window opens up to go home. They take the Earth return vehicle home. They leave the habitat behind on Mars. Each time you do this, you add another habitat to the base. Before you know it, you got the beginning of the first human settlement on a new world. Now, Musk took that idea and he altered it by saying, okay, I'm going to fly to Mars in the same ship that I'm going to return in. I'm going to make my return propellant on Mars for this ship and, 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 and so forth. Uh, methane oxygen, same thing, direct flight, direct return, long duration stay. Uh, and in fact, ultimately with Musk, it's a permanent state because he's interested in colonization. Uh, okay, fine. My criticisms of this plan, and I did write an in-depth criticism uh, when the ITS, which is the predecessor of uh, Starship, was first set forth at Guadalajara in 2016, and uh, it's also contained in, in briefer form in the case for space, is the, I, well, the ITS was very big. It was 500 tons to Leo. Musk did scale that down, which was smart, to about 150 tons to Leo, same as the Saturn V. That's still pretty big, uh, though. And the, um, the flying that all the way to Mars, it takes an awful lot of propellant to send it back, okay, uh, which puts a lot of stress on the Mars base. Uh, and, but furthermore, it may, puts the Starship out of action for three years going to Mars and back. I prefer just to send it up and down to Earth orbit. So instead of using it in three years, I could use it again the next week, either from Mars or to support a lunar mission or anything I'm interested in. Uh, but basically deliver the payload to Earth orbit and then stage off of it to send the payloads to Mars. So basically I would have the same mission architecture as Mars Direct, except instead of using an expendable heavy lift launch vehicle is what we proposed when we first proposed Mars Direct, uh, we would have a fully reusable uh, launch vehicle, which would make the whole thing much cheaper and, and, and more sustainable. It can have a lot more missions. So uh, I think Starship could be enabling for a Mars direct type mission, and we wouldn't have to make a thousand tons of propellant on Mars per mission. We only need to make a hundred tons, right. um, as I propose. 
But it's got to feel good that there is a experiment going to Mars on the Mars 2020 rover that's actually going to be testing out the idea of making propellant on Mars yes. uh, okay. right away. That is, that is a step. Uh, it's a small step because it's a pretty small experiment. But yes, they are going to make oxygen on Mars out of CO2. And that's uh, uh, at least, uh, I mean, it's a useful demonstration and it's an, uh, also a useful advance in NASA's thinking because look, the question of whether an environment is habitable or not for you is whether you can take the materials that are there and turn them into resources. There's, there's no such thing as natural resources. Actually, there's no such thing as natural resources on the earth. It's only natural raw materials. It is human technology turns materials into resources. Land was not a resource till people invented agriculture. Oil was not a resource till we invented oil drilling and refining and machines that could run on the product. Uranium was not a resource till we developed nuclear fission. Deuterium is not a resource now. Right. It will be if we develop fusion. But, but, you know, Mars has no resources. The moon has no resources now, but they will once resourceful people go there. Okay. And, and so this is the critical question. It's not just about getting there. It's a question of knowing how to live there. Do you, do you feel like the knowing how to live there, do you feel like people are prematurely assuming the way they're going to live there and sort of focusing on that, you know, sending a building of city of a million people before some of the fundamental questions about what is the best way to live there? You know, is that, where do you think that all sort of sits in because it doesn't seem like a lot of like, like I could sit down and brainstorm about a 100 problems for living on Mars. And I'm sure you've probably got a list of a 1000. You know, where are people go to the bathroom and how are they going to protect themselves from radiation? And how much are they going to want to eat? Where are they going to get their water from? And what about living and working in low gravity? And can babies just it's so on and so forth It goes on and on and on. I'm sure you have a list. And I'm sure you have solutions for many of them. But you know, as an engineer, they need to be tested and they need to be specialized. And do you think that that it's almost like that whole step is being uh, downplayed? Well, uh, I don't even think Musk really believes that the first people that go to Mars are going to go to stay as part of a wave of 100,000 people and with another 100,000 coming in every year, you know, so it's just like Normandy Beach, just storm it. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think the way this is going to work, I, I break it down into a number of phases. First missions will be exploration missions. There'll be long duration exploration missions, a year and a half on Mars, uh, and then come back. But nevertheless, they will be round trip missions. Uh, then after a number of these missions, we'll have a base phase in which we'll go from, you know, four, five, six people on Mars to 20, 30, 50 people on Mars at a base. And that base will continue to support exploration, but also it will be doing engineering research on, on a significant scale in terms of not only how to make fuel and oxygen on Mars, but how to make all the different metals, how to make plastics, fabric, how to grow crops in quantity in automated greenhouses and so forth, and, and all of this. Now, some of the people that go to that base will also only spend a year and a half on Mars, but some might accept bonuses to stay in extra rotation. So now they're on Mars three and a half years or five and a half years. I mean, given the cost of sending people back and forth, uh, any space agency uh, would be willing probably to give a million dollars, stay on Mars an extra year. And most people say, oh, a million dollars. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, so you'll start getting some lifers there and they'll form relationships. And then you'll start seeing children born on Mars, at which point you'll need to set up institutions appropriate to that, schools and what have you. And, and at that point, the base starts turning itself into a settlement. Now, and then the settlement can grow. I think that in the course of growing, a Mars settlement will solve all sorts of technological pro uh, problems in dealing with its extreme labor shortage, uh, problems in, in uh, automated manufacturing and automated greenhouses, labor-saving machinery, robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, super abundant genetically modified organism crops, all these things they'll need. These inventions will be licensable on Earth. This can create income. And so the colony can grow, provided it has institutions that promote this kind of creativity. Because um, the best thing to export from Mars is information. Uh, and, and, and the most valuable information you can have is a patent. And the, um, you get a lot of money for that. Now, um, you know, 
then let's take it to the next level. What about a thousand person Mars colony? Okay, where you really have a society, where you have an economy. Um, the Mars Society, you know, is holding right now a contest. We had over a hundred entrants from around the world to design a 1,000 person Mars colony. And it has now been narrowed down to 10 finalists. They come from a number of different countries. They're all gonna present at the Mars Society Conference at the University of Southern California, October 17th through 20th. They're coming from Poland and France, United States, Russia, everywhere. And, uh, and they have to cover all the bases. It's 40 points for the technical merit, 30 for uh, the e econ economy, and 10 each for the social system, the political system, and also for the aesthetics of the design of the place. Um, so we're going to see some in-depth thinking on how to create a 1,000-person Mars colony. And uh, probably next year, we'll offer a prize for a million-person colony, because that's a, a different kind of thing as well. Right. Uh, and, um, but I think it's something that will evolve. And in the course of that evolution, we will get answers to all these different sorts of issues that you raised. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the biggest one, I feel like every one of them is solvable. Um, the one that, that I still think there's insufficient knowledge about is what 38% gravity does to the human body and does to the human fetus. And, and are there any, uh, you know, life long lived birth defects or are humans even viable? Um, and I know there are solutions to this, like you build a, a gravity train or some kind of rotating space station that's on the surface of Mars that allows you to sort of balance out the gravity of Earth of the gra you know, the gravity of Mars, and then use, um, you know, centripetal force to to give Earth gravity. Um, but that, you know, that is a thing that might never that can never be solved unless, I don't know, genetic engineering or, or whatever. Well, I, I think that, first of all, um, we should start learning about one yeah. third gravity. You know, the, the Mars Society, uh, in our initial contact with Musk, we got him interested uh, in supporting the development of a satellite that would be a spinner that would create Mars gravity for a crew of mice and they fly in space and you would get to see how one third gravity affected mature mice born on earth as well as those born and raised in one third gravity. We have actually no data on that. Of course, that's just uh, mice, but uh, after that, yeah. uh, we, of course, we'll get data when the first humans go to Mars. Uh, you know, I once asked Buzz Aldrin, who of course had experienced earth gravity, zero gravity and moon gravity, okay? What did moon gravity feel like? Did it, did it feel like Earth gravity or zero gravity? Of course, the moon is only one-sixth gravity. And he said, it's like Earth gravity, okay? There's an up, there's a down. The fluids inside of you go to the right places instead of kind of floating around to whatever part of the body they want to go to. Uh, that is from a psychological and physiological point of view, one sixth gravity is far more like one gravity than it is like zero gravity. And of course, one third gravity would be even more like regular gravity. I think it's reasonable to assume that people in one third gravity, unless they take the trouble to implement strenuous exercise programs, might see deterioration of their musculature because they don't wouldn't get as much of a workout as someone walking around in one G. But um, I, but but I don't think that they'll get uh, a lot of the other problems we see in zero gravity, which are functions of all sorts of, uh, you know, fluid motions inside the body that set off incorrect en endocrine signals that trigger various uh, pathologies, because uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, and uh, but ultimately, it's something which you're going to have to see. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it, it feels to me like like there was a great opportunity. There was a a, um, a module that had been planned for the International Space Station called the Nautilus X, I believe. And it was going to be a fairly small centrifuge that would be attached to the station, relatively low budget and and rotated, you know, fast enough to provide astronauts with some version of some kind of artificial gravity to at least see if you can deal with some of the effects of microgravity. And I've actually seen versions of this, like there's some really interesting tests actually around the corner from you in Colorado, uh, at uh, University of, of Boulder, they're, um, they're building, they're essentially testing out how well people can adapt 
to rotating cylinders at, you know, that you may get nauseous in the beginning, but in fact, after with, with practice, after about a month of practice, you can handle rapid rotation actually pretty well. And so right. it might well, be that a, that a, a personal gravity system to help your body deal with whatever is the right amount could actually be very launchable, you know, fit within a yeah, Falcon maybe, 9. Okay, but uh, actually, my preferred way to, to, first of all, do gravity in space, I don't think we need to create artificial gravity on Mars. There is natural gravity. But in space, artificial gravity is greatly to be desired because otherwise you have zero gravity. And the way I think we could do uh, a human artificial gravity experiment, this is actually a, a place where Orion has a very good use. Because you could launch Orion to Earth orbit with a crew in it. And then you tether off the upper stage of the launch vehicle that, in other words, let's say this is Orion and this is the upper stage of the launch vehicle. Okay, so here's the capsule, here's the heat shield. Um, and you tether off and then you spin this thing up. Okay, and now you can create lunar gravity or Mars gravity or whatever you want inside of the Orion. And the thing about Orion that I like for this is that it's... Uh, so you could use a dragon to fly to lunar orbit to play the role of the Apollo command module. But Orion, and it'd be better because it's lighter, but the Orion has a bigger space, more accommodations. If you want to live a month in space, you could do that in Orion. And uh, it could be a small temporary artificial gravity space station. And you could put people in there for a week or a month and see what the physiological effects of one third gravity are. Uh, or, or lunar gravity for that matter. And the, um, and, and, but then the advantage is, is you're not really imposing anything on the ISS. And if anything goes wrong, you cut the cable and you've got your own re-entry system right there. Uh, you're in it. You can come down, land, you know, uh, Move tell the people tumble. what's like. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, so to me, this would actually be a very good application for Orion. Uh, Orion, unfortunately, is so heavy that it's uh, uh, an impediment to lunar exploration. You know, the Orion is 26 tons. The Apollo command module is nine. Uh, Dragon is 10. Um, the Apollo Orion. I had no is so idea. Heavy. Wow. Yeah. Orion is so heavy that the SLS cannot get it into low lunar orbit with enough propellant for it to come home. Uh, now, if instead you were using Dragon, it could, which would. Um, help also you can make the sls more powerful by giving a, a proper upper stage um but in any case but for certain missions uh like a mission that could be done in earth orbit where you want an independent spacecraft that for instance you could put on a tether and do artificial gravity orion's perfect yeah um well there you go uh, uh nasa just uh, ordered six more orions put in potential order for 12 more so they'll have 12 chances to experiment with artificial gravity um if they think of it yeah yeah so so one of the the sort of i actually have a poster behind me i don't know if you can see it uh gravity wells are for suckers my you know i am more in the o'neill camp that you know that to a certain extent like we go to Antarctica and we have a scientific research station there and there's tremendous work that gets done there, telescopes there. But for the sort of long-term habitation of humanity, it, it feels to me like it makes more sense to go the Gerard O'Neill route and live in, in space itself where you can control the gravity with the kind of precision that you require. Um, so, you know, what do you see if we we're like 200 years down the road where and, and human, humanity has become a spacefaring civilization, where do you see the populations mostly being centered? Well, OK, well, first of all, Earth and Mars. And yes, we can make O'Neill colonies in the asteroid belt. I don't believe in the O'Neill vision of moving Earth, asteroids into Earth orbit so you can have cities there. Uh, that support building solar power satellites. Uh, uh, to me, that's not credible. There's so many other ways to make electricity on Earth that are cheaper than putting solar panels in orbit. For instance, you could put them on the ground on Earth and, and the extra power you get from having them in space isn't worth the trouble. Uh, but there is something that would justify an O'Neill colony, and that is simply to have 
an independent nation, an independent city state in space, because there's nothing more valuable than freedom. So if you were to go to metal asteroids and hollow them out and make them into O'Neill colonies, and in the course of that, you refine out the platinum and the cobalt, you know, the valuable stuff, that you can ship back to Earth. The steel you keep in the asteroid belt to build space cities. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, there's always going to be people that have new ideas on how people should live together. And in general, they're not going to be popular with other everybody else. Uh, and they need to have a place where they can go, where they can give their ideas a try. Now, Mars is one such place, but the asteroids offer thousands of such places. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is uh, uh, where this is a more difficult thing to do than to just build cities on Mars. I mean, it's a lot harder to build a planet than it is to settle one. But nevertheless, if we're talking 200 years out, yes, I do believe we'll have such things. So I'm not against the O'Neill vision, but I think it's putting the cart before the horse. So one of the other sort of themes that I've been thinking quite a lot about is that that the real technology that's going to unleash our ability to live in space and, and to go to other places is is uh, in situ resource utilization about being able to actually harvest our resources from space. But almost more important than that is space based manufacturing. It's kind of ridiculous that we have to build a telescope on Earth, it has to handle Earth gravity it has to handle the rigors of space, it has to unfold in some kind of origami way and then do its job while it's out in space, doesn't it make a lot more sense when you're in microgravity to construct the kinds of structures in in space itself? Are we, you know, how far along that journey do you think that we are to actually being able to properly build things well, in space? And, and... Things, well, we're just beginning, but the local resource creation, because once again, I don't believe that there are natural resources. I think there's only natural materials. It's we who turn them into resources, human creativity. Uh, but local resource creation is essential. And clearly it's enormously advantageous to make in space anything that's going to be used in space. And you mentioned uh, giant telescopes, solar sails, uh, of course, propellants. Uh, Clearly, if you want to build an O'Neill space colony, you want to build it out of steel that you find in space as opposed to launch from the ground on Earth. Okay, uh, so all those things I, I absolutely agree with. And in fact, most of the work of my company is trying to develop such technologies. Um, we do other things too, but that's where we're, we're our strongest. Yep. Um, the, uh, now, there's also a few things you can make in space for use on earth but these are specialty items for instance there are people that have demonstrated the company made in space has demonstrated making fiber optic cables in zero g that are vastly superior than anything you can make on the ground on earth so sure okay so if you can make something in space that you can't make on the ground and that's and it's a sufficiently valuable item then sure uh but the idea that we're going to move industry from earth into space I, I don't think it makes any sense. Okay. In other words, the idea that we're going to put uh, steel mills uh, for making steel for use on Earth in space, so you launch the iron ore to orbit and then you bring it down as steel. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. Okay. And 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 other you know bulk goods. Uh, you know, so certainly we'll make in space everything for use in space, uh, and we'll make in space some things for use on Earth that are very high value and are unique, uh, but you know, you don't want to import, you know, gravel from the moon. Um, you know, I mean, you could, but it makes yeah. no sense. <laughs> no, but if you're going to build a, a house on the moon, you're going to want to use gravel from the moon. If you're going to want to build your house sure. in space, you're going to want your gravel from space. That's Absolutely. all. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But you see, but that goes the other way. The earth is in space. So if you're building a house on earth, you want to take the materials from the earth. Yes. Yes. It's like any other planet. <laughs> yeah. But 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 I so you talked a bit about about space power and you're a lot more pessimistic about space power than I think a lot of other people are. So why do you think that it doesn't make sense to generate power in space and and try to send that home? Well, a, a couple of reasons. 
see, first of all, power, electricity, is not a unique item. To the consumer, it does, it, what matters is here's a plug, I can plug something in, I got electricity. And to the consumer, it doesn't really matter whether it comes from coal, natural gas, nuclear power, solar power, windmills, waterfalls, geothermal power, whatever, it's all the same, okay? Now, so you say, well, solar energy, okay, fine. Um, the extra solar flux you get by putting something in orbit is at best a factor of four more than you get by putting it on the ground in Arizona. And, uh, and first, then you lose half of it in the transmission. The panel itself costs hundreds of times more per, because uh, space panels that are radiation hard instead of common silicon panels you can buy on Earth. And then there's the cost of launching it and also the transmission equipment. And then the environmental issues associated with the, sending the microwaves through the Earth's atmosphere and, and so on. And so it, it, that business plan does not make sense. Actually, you know, power in space is much more valuable than power on Earth. So if you want to beam power, it would make more sense to make power on the surface of the Earth and beam it up. Uh, you know, the, 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 the space station has like a 100 kilowatt power system and it costs billions of dollars. You can buy a 100 kilowatt uh, generator on Earth for $100,000. Okay, you know, this is just huge. Uh, uh, four orders of magnitude difference in the cost of things uh, that way. So no, now fusion power, um, okay, uh, once again, as an energy source for the earth is in competitive competition with all these other things. Uh, in space though, it would have unique advantages in that for instance, it would enable fusion powered rockets, which can get exhaust velocities as high as 7% the speed of light, which means you'd enable spacecraft that could exceed 10% the speed of light, which gives you uh, uh, the capability not only to zip around the solar system, but even marginal capability for interstellar travel. Now, you know, and maybe fusion will be developed first there. You know, uh, steam engines were developed first for mines, but efficient steam engines did not appear until they were developed for steam boats. And nuclear fission has been a mixed bag um, sometimes competitive, sometimes not as a power source, but it is uh, incomparable as a way to propel submarines. In other words, it has, in particular applications, it is superior, full stop. Right. Okay. Generally, um, fusion, you know, on the moon, you've got hard vacuum, deep space, of course, hard vacuum. Uh, on Mars, uh, deuterium is six times as common as on Earth, and you don't have competition from fossil fuels, and you could make solar power, but it's weak. Uh, you know, so I, I think uh, we may develop fusion power first, first uh, uh, or really give it a, um, a strong market of its own in space. And as it gets perfected there, eventually, um, it could come back to earth and, and, and start replacing uh, fossil fuels and such. Um, but, uh, but solar power, uh, certainly to power spacecraft, if you're close enough to the sun, sure. But to export, exporting solar energy from space to earth is like exporting gravel from the moon to earth. It's a common commodity as opposed to those fiber optic cables made by made in space, which are a unique product. Right. And so it might be that there are other other products that are developed and figured out in space, which then have unique value um, here on Earth. I actually did a video about those those cables that that you can form the crystals in a way in, in microgravity that you just can't do on on Earth. Um, so uh, so I know that like for a, like we live in this world that is uh you know that science fiction you know star trek uh star wars things like that have brought us have got us very excited about the future and of course now that astronomers are finding thousands of extrasolar worlds we're knowing that we're not alone in the universe in terms of planets anyway and that there's so many other frontiers that we can go out to and explore and yet people always sort of underestimate just how far it is to go to these other worlds. You talked briefly about fusion. 
which of the kinds of technologies that we have our disposal in the future do you think is going to be the one that helps us actually be able to go to another star system? Well, I think fusion is very important. Um, uh, I think power beaming, uh, you know, lasers, um, okay, either pushing light sails as uh, Breakthrough Starshot proposes, or transmitting power to a spacecraft, allowing it to use some form of electrical propulsion, either with onboard propellant or with, you know, as you know, I've set forth a, a concept called the dipole drive, which can use ambient plasma for propellant, but it needs power. And if the power system is too heavy, it takes too long to accelerate to very high velocities, such as interstellar class velocities. But if the power could be transmitted, that would change that picture a lot. Uh, power beaming, by the way, in space, um, you know, uh, I think we're going to see it for that purpose. I mean, you know, O'Neill power beaming of 40,000 kilometers, that's visionary. But for instance, at a moon base, to be able to beam power into the crater to help get the water out, now you're beaming 10 kilometers, uh, or just, um, you know, transmitting power from orbital spacecraft to ground assets so that you can have power wherever you need it, when you need it. The, these are, are useful things. In this case, pow Beam's power is not in competition with Niagara Falls. It's, it's just, a, it's in competition with trying to string power lines across the surface of the moon, um, which is unattractive. Uh, and, and, and so I think we're gonna start to see power beaming for local use on the moon and Mars, and then eventually a very long distance power transmission, not to feed the earth terrestrial market, but to propel uh, and power spacecraft. And you you mentioned sort of your version is like an, an in-between step, the the Saturn direct mission in the, in the book, which would be sort of an, in, an intermediate step for us attempting to go to another star. And th this has been my concern with, with all the talk of, say, the breakthrough star shot. People are proposing sending these, these tiny little chipped spacecraft to other star systems. But if you could make this work, you could explore the entire solar system Let's start there, because it's yeah. so underexplored. Right. So yes, Saturn Express is um, a smaller and low-tech version of the Starshot. Um, it uses the, you know, look, there's there's uh, three parts to the Starshot uh, program that they need. They need uh, a micro spacecraft. They need a very thin solar sail, and they need, uh, you know, a gigawatt laser. Now, of those three things two are well within reach, okay? You know, if, if, if Milner were to offer a prize, you know, for, you know, uh, a 10 gram spacecraft, you know, that can do X, Y, and Z, probably within two years, some kids from MIT will have come up with it. Um, and, uh, and similarly, a thin solar sail, okay, a little tougher, but sure, we could do it and have a one micron thick solar sail. And then that, with a tiny spacecraft, yeah, you get to Saturn in a year or so. And uh, um, and this would be a powerful tool for outer solar system exploration. Go multiple missions, not with giant spacecraft or large spacecraft like Cassini, but tiny little spacecraft will launch one today. Oh, we'll launch another one next week with a different instrument on it uh, and, and what have you. And, and frequent probes to Neptune and the Kuiper Belt. Uh, and this would move things along and, uh, you know, the lasers will come when they do, but that's a, a more distant prospect, but we could at least demonstrate some of the key technologies here and, and get a lot of utility out of it. Yeah. Um, and you even propose, uh, you know, how we might, you know, if Mars is sort of been long living on Mars, we're going to want to potentially set up shop on other places in the in the outer solar system. Uh, you know, apart from Mars, uh, and sort of further out into the solar system, what world most intrigues you? Well, intrigue, of course, Titan. Um, all right, uh, a world with a atmosphere, atmospheric pressure very similar to Earth, um, you know, and, and the atmosphere is thicker. Uh, so if you could actually strap wings on your arms and fly like a bird on Titan, you wouldn't need a pressure suit, just warm clothing. <laughs> really and, thick coat. And, and, a, and a breathing mask. 
uh, the uh, I think the okay as I say the asteroids offer the prospects of of creation of thousands of independent city states in space. Um, the outer solar system has vast supplies of helium three, um, millions of times more than the moon has. Um, so if you want to power human future with fusion, that's uh, very attractive. Uh, and of course, we're now discovering literally thousands of worlds orbiting other stars. Um, I think the most important thing um, that people need to understand about space is making it clear that the Earth doesn't have a roof. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean it. Okay. I like it. Yeah, yeah. That, that we're not locked in here. Not, you know, in the book, The Case for Space, the final third of it, I devote to discussing not the how, but the why. Why we need to do this, you know, for the knowledge, all the incredible yeah. knowledge of science we need in space. Survival, stopping asteroid impacts, okay? And we're not going to space to desert the Earth. We're going to space to protect the Earth, okay? The challenge, okay, how that will inspire the development of intellectual capital. And the future, the grand future that we can create of the expanded humanity. But also, though, there's a, a section that I just like would like to talk about for a minute now, which is we need to go to space to defeat the greatest threat that faces humanity today. And that's not climate change or resource exhaustion or even asteroid impact. None of those things created the great disasters of the 20th century. Okay. Things that created the great disaster of the 20th century were bad ideas, and in particular, one bad idea. And that idea was that there isn't enough for everybody. There isn't enough to go around. So we are going to have to fight it out with them. And if you ever have that situation where we are going to have to fight it out against them sooner or later, it's going to either be to the advantage of us or them to have the fight sooner rather than later. Okay, guys, it can't be... Time can't be on the side of both sides, okay? And so it means it happens sooner, okay? And so, you know, 1912, okay, General Friedrich von Bernhardi, one of the chief intellectuals of the German general staff, writes international bestseller in English entitled Germany in the Next War, in which he said, look, you know, there's only so much here, and Eurasia is either going to belong to Germany or to Russia. We're going to have to have it out with them. And should it be sooner or later? Well, clearly sooner because we can take them down now before they industrialize. So 1914 comes along. And despite the fact that Germany and all of Europe, for that matter, was more prosperous, people living better than they ever had in human history, the Germans decide to take advantage of the pretext of the assassination of the Archduke to initiate World War I. Okay. 39, Hitler, even more hysterical laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so that the better may live. Germany needs living space, blah, blah. Well, total nonsense. Germany never needed living space. Germany today has much smaller territory than the Third Reich, a larger population and a vastly higher standard of living, which they obtain not by stealing other people's living space, but by technological invention of, from people all over the world, including from races they were trying to exterminate. Um, and and now today, you've got people thinking war with China is inevitable because there's so many of them. And if they ever have a standard of living like us, there won't be enough oil in the world. And, you know, and you can bet that there are people in Beijing who look at this problem from the other side of the chessboard, think the same thing about us. And this is crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, as the world's population has gone up, the standard of living has gone up, not down. And that's because standard of living depends on productivity, which depends on technology, which depends on invention. And the more people, the more inventions and inventions are cumulative. Okay. But nevertheless, trying to prove that to people is like trying to show to a mathematically unsophisticated person that there's an infinite number of points in a line segment. So it seems like there can only be so much room in a line segment. That takes sophistication to understand that there's actually an infinite number of points in a line segment, just as there's an infinite amount of potential resource on Earth. It, it does not seem to, it, it seems apparent there could only be so much to go around if we're stuck on Earth. But, it, but anyone, even the most mathematically unsophisticated person, could understand this infinite number of points in a line that goes off infinitely in both directions. And the point is about space is not that we're going to bring back oil from Mars, okay? But it's that by 
showing that there's no roof above us, that we're not walled in by a crystal sphere, that we're not stuck in here like rats in a cage and we're sooner or later we're going to have to fight out. That it's simply not true that there isn't enough to go around because the earth has an infinite sky and it's wide open. And that fundamentally is the case in space. Well, I think that's where we will leave uh, this conversation. Uh, Dr. Zubrin, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with me today. I apologize to, uh, to everyone who asked a bunch of questions, but I wasn't going to stop you. Um, so I think that was, that was great. Uh, again, of course, you can get The Case for Space. Uh, and if you haven't already, like I said, go back and read The Case for Mars. I, I'm going to give it another read to sort of see how it, how it holds up. Um, for people who want to follow and participate, of course, you can go to the uh, Mars Society website. And of course, you're active on Twitter. Um, uh, there was... Um, and then talk about that contest. How can people get involved in that contest to be able to help design a Mars habitat? Okay, well, okay, the, the contest this year, it, it, you know, we've already down to the finalists. If people want to see it, they should come to the Mars Society Conference with the University of Southern California, October 17th through 20th, and, and there'll be all sorts of presentations. And there's going to be a debate uh, at the conference on the night of the 17th between me and Greg Autry on the subject of the lunar orbit gateway, the deep space gateway, if you will. He supports it. I oppose it. We're going to have it out. Formal debate. Okay, he's the positive team. I'm the negative team. Okay, I think we should have more debates in space. Too many things are done without proper debate. And so I, I, I think it's going to be great. Um, but next year, we're going to have another contest. Uh, and uh, we'll announce it at our conference, and we'll also announce it on our website, which is marssociety.org, and certainly people will be able to enter then. The contest this year had a 10,000, pass a $10,000 first prize, $5,000 second prize, yep. $2,500 third prize, et cetera. And um, so we're really looking forward to that. Wonderful. And, and then there's going to be at the conference banquet, uh, Paul Wooster from SpaceX is going to lay out SpaceX's plans for oh, Mars. We may have some of the cast of the Expanse there as well. Uh, and also on the Friday night uh, of the 18th, uh, we're having a Mars Rocks rock concert. Uh, and uh, so people, are, that should be a lot of fun too. Well, wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I'm glad we were able to make this work. Uh, now get your ass to Mars. Get your ass to Mars. All right. So this is one Mars Society Conference, which you can find out about at marssociety.org. Perfect. All right. Thanks a lot. See you later, everybody. Thank you.